In the beginning of the 20th century, a school of thought arose with René Guénon, Ananda Kumra Swami, and Frithjof Schuon, which has focused on the enunciation and explanation of the timeless truth that lives in the heart of all the great religions. This truth, sometimes referred to as the Sophia Perennis, perennial wisdom, or the perennial philosophy, finds its expression in the revealed scriptures as well as the writings of the great sages and the artistic creations of the traditional worlds. The perennial philosophy concerns all that is most profound and common to all great religions. Uh, that truth or those truths which lie at the heart of all religions and which have always and always will lie at the heart of all religions. It is known by the name, as I say, of religio perennis or the perennial philosophy. The idea that all of the world's major religions are rooted in one single divine source, one divine principle. And the idea is that like a perennial flower which blooms every year, this one source of all wisdom has blossomed forth, as it were, throughout history. And the major religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, are understood to be like flowerings forth of that wisdom. Perennial, of course, means literally year by year. Uh, in other words, something that's always there. So the, the perennial philosophy is the timeless philosophy, the philosophy that's been available to us from the beginning of time. A body of truths, of principles, which are unaffected by time. They're not contingent, they're not the production of one culture or another culture, they're not ideas that have arisen in a particular historical formation. Uh, they're ideas, principles, truths, which are permanent, which have always been with us. So it's, it's from, a, from, a, from the point of view we're discussing here, it's not a matter of trying to think up some new ideas, it's a matter of uh, trying to understand those ideas and principles which have always been. One can speak about all the religions having a common inward truth. Indeed, I would say one can speak about all the religions having in common truth, virtue, beauty, and prayer. This is a formulation that Frithjof Schuon has used. Mr. Schuon? Yes? You have written more than 25 books yes. on religion and spirituality. Yes. Your first book was entitled The Transcendent Unity of yes. Religions. Yes. May I ask you how one should understand this unity? This unity? Yes. Because there is only one truth, and this truth is obliged to manifest itself through different forms because these forms are possibilities, different possibilities. It's like language. We have different languages, different races, different times, Satya Yuga, Dvapara Yuga, Treta Yuga, Kali Yuga. So mentality changes. Uh, Aryan is not a Simai, the Mongol is not an Indian, and so on. And the metaphysics then is the truth behind the meanings? Yes, the one truth behind uh, different expressions. The relationship of the perennial philosophy to the historical religions is like the relationship of the unique essence to its different forms. If you think of the yin-yang of the Chinese or the shahada of the Muslims, or if you like the beginning of the Gospel of St. John, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God and the Word was made flesh and lived within us. These are all expressions of different traditions that are very fundamental. They are expressions of a fundamental truth upon which many other truths or many aspects of the truth become evident. Everything else proceeds from these very fundamental truths. And uh, this is 
the uh, similar relationship between the un unique essence and its different forms. The forms build upon the unique essence of God that has found its way into the different forms, and yet the way that those different forms manifest themselves are uh, very different, one being in a Chinese milieu and another being in a, a, a Muslim uh, uh, Near Eastern milieu and so on. So what matters really when you get down to the, the bottom of it is who God is, who man is, and what the relationship between the two is. Religion is there to bind man back to God. And in fact, that's what the origin of the word religion means, to bind. So throughout time, God of course is the same. And if we accept that man is made in the image of God, the essence of these teachings is the same. It never changes as long as we know what God is, what man is, uh, and uh, their relationship. The Philosophia Perennis embodies those universal truths to which no one people or age can make exclusive claim. There is only one mythology, one iconography, and one truth, that of an uncreated wisdom that has been handed down from time immemorial. Ananda Kumaraswamy. A perennialist is one who understands, as best they can, the perennial philosophy, who adheres to it, who not only subscribes to it as a set of propositions, but who tries to live by it, who tries to actualize it. Traditionalist, I think I used to use this term a lot myself, and in fact uh, my first book was entitled Traditionalism. It's a term I feel less comfortable with now, uh, because I think it's more limited than perennialist. Uh, tradition is certainly one of the key ideas in both Gainon and Shuon. And uh, the basic idea is that tradition is more or less, more or less synonymous with the perennial philosophy. That, the, that tradition with a capital T is the truth enshrined in the perennial philosophy available at all times to all manner of men and women throughout history, wherever they find themselves. Tradition speaks to each man the language he can understand, provided he be willing to listen. This reservation is essential, for tradition, we repeat, cannot become bankrupt. It is rather of man's bankruptcy that one should speak, for it is he who has lost the intuition of the supernatural and the sense of the sacred. Fifth Joff Shuan. The traditions, the traditions are really the religions, to explain it as simply as possible. The Islamic tradition, the Hindu tradition, the Chinese tradition. So these are traditions which emerge from a revelation, that at a particular point there is a divine revelation which issues forth in a whole way of life, a whole civilization. This is really, I mean, again, the modern mind finds this difficult to apprehend, but this is really what a civilization is. It's a incarnation, as it were, a playing out through time of the truths enshrined in a particular revelation. So what is the Islamic civilization? It is the material working out the material manifestation of the descent of the Quran, the life of the Prophet and so on. All of this is, that is the foundation from which all else flows. So a traditionalist is someone who believes in tradition in both those senses. Tradition as a kind of primordial wisdom and the traditions. So a traditionalist believes in the primordial wisdom and believes in the validity of the different religious traditions because they all come from God. It is tradition that transmits the sacred models and the working rules, 
and thereby guarantees the spiritual validity of the forms. Tradition possesses a secret power which is communicated to an entire civilization and determines even those arts and crafts whose immediate objects include nothing particularly sacred. This power creates the style of a traditional civilization. Titus Burkhardt. I've come to the view recently that perennialist is a more satisfactory term, although of course not without its problems also, because in the, in the popular mind, the phrase the perennial philosophy is associated of course with Huxley and with Huxley's book of the 1940s, The Perennial Philosophy, a fine book in many ways, but uh, in other ways rather confused and idiosyncratic. And there are also various quasi-spiritual, quasi-religious movements which lay claim to a perennial philosophy. So sometimes the works of someone like Mr. Shuon or Gainon become confused with, let us say, Aurobindo or Aldous Huxley or people of this sort. And this this kind of confusion can lead to a lot of misunderstanding. So uh, even with the term perennialist, it needs to be defined and clarified and uh, disassociated from various other movements which share a certain amount of ground with the perennialists proper, but which in other respects are actually, they don't realise this, but they are actually symptomatic of the confusions of modernity. I think that often the name of the school of thought or an intellectual perspective only comes about sometime after that perspective has already been articulated. In the case of the traditionalist school or the perennialist school as it's variously called today, the founders of that school themselves were not overly interested in titles. One might even say that they weren't interested in the ism, but in the thing itself, in the content of the school. Now, of course, this content relates to perennial truths and to traditional doctrines. So in that sense, the terms perennialism and traditionalism uh, are a convenient shorthand way of referring to this school and to its central ideas. The perennialist school is um, a school which was in fact initiated by René Guénon as the first writer in time. In the 20s already he wrote The Crisis of the Modern World and to which later writers such as Friedrich Schwann, Ananda Kumaraswamy, Martin Links and many others uh, joined in the sense that they all expressed the same views about the time in which we live and about truth in its many facets. Traditional societies were closed systems, meaning that each religion had its own culture based on its beliefs and traditions, of course, going back to time immemorial. But with the Renaissance in the West, there uh, developed a kind of materialism and scientism. This undermined the religious sensibilities of Westerners and led to a marked secularization of society. At that same time, travel was also becoming easier and so religious uh, cultures from around the world began to mix. When you come into contact with another religious tradition and you sense truth in it, it's a, a natural uh, result that people will begin to question whether their own religious tradition is the exclusive way to the truth. And then uh, it came to the uh, 19th century when, of course, uh, there was an explosion in secularization and in a distrust of tradition and a confusion regarding the exclusivity of religions and so on. Into that scene, uh, René Guénon, 
his writings uh, uh, appeared in the early 20th century, and his writings reminded the world that there are eternal truths that underlie all of the traditions. His point was that within each tradition, there are the same truths, and these truths are simply expressed in different ways, in the different traditions. Thus, one can understand in depth the religion of another simply because their religion is lying upon the same foundation, really, of the same fundamental concepts as your own. And Guénon's reiteration of those uh, truths, his thought became uh, uh, known as the perennial philosophy, uh, and uh, his writings were really the beginning of the perennialist school of thought. So Guénon is considered the forerunner of the perennial school of thought, and this school of thought was to find its full development later on in the writings of Christoph Schuon. Yes, René Guénon was the first to write, first of all, uh, criticizing the modern world, placing it where it belongs, that is to say at the very end of what the Hindus call the Kali Yuga, the fourth age, and then to speak about metaphysics, ultimate reality, uh, and its innumerable modalities and attributes and aspects. So first of all, he cleared the ground, so to say, by saying the modern world is something quite unusual and extraordinary in the life of humanity. And then, having made a tabula rasa, he built up an understanding of what tradition means, what religion means, etc., etc. His work is a tremendous work which has led thousands of people to the truth and uh, especially uh, Guénon's writings on symbolism uh, they are quite outstanding. He was very familiar at a profound level with the Hindu doctrines and with the Taoist doctrines and much of his teaching had a Hindu tinge or a Taoist tinge. Gainon's view was that modernity is really a kind of negation, that the whole modern world view is in a sense built on ignorance. It's, it, it, it seems to be a positive world view which gives us an alternative way of understanding things, but its essential character is the denial of the transcendent and the denial of metaphysics, uh, a kind of flattening out of our understanding of reality to, a, to an entirely horizontal and profane level, so that all, all of the vertical, so to speak, is, is eradicated. Ananda Kumaraswamy, from an early age, he manifested his genius in the realm of scholarship. He, he uh, devoted himself principally to what is expressed in the titles of one of his early books, The History of Indian and Indonesian Art. Relatively late in his life, he discovered the writings of René Guénon, and immediately that opened up his, it was like a stroke of lightning, lightening up his horizon. He was already one who understood traditional Hindu art in depth, but the writings of Guénon opened up to him in the perspective of the traditionalist vision of things, and he became a great exponent of the traditionalist point of view. He considered himself and always said that he believed in the Philosophia Perennis, uh, had uh, uh, you know, this was essentially the fruit, you might say, of his uh, seeking the truth in a variety of places and ways. And uh, he certainly believed uh, that the truth has always uh, been with us in one form or another. 
though often renewed uh, by uh, a divine descent of one form or another. As uh, the world grew old and uh, people forgot these perennial truths, God in his mercy would uh, renew them uh, in the most effective way. And I think that he felt that way. Friedrich Schwann is the all-embracing author and most preeminent author of the traditional school in that he has not only written about art and metaphysics and the modern world, but he has also written extensively about what it means to be man in the sense of men and women, to be a human being. What is our vocation? Why are we on earth? And he described the various paths through which if we follow our vocation, we return to the divine. There is nothing in Geno uh, which is not uh, to be found in Shuan. There is much in Shuan which is not to be found in Geno. If I were to uh, compare him with uh, current philosophers, uh, theologians, uh, my impulse is to say, uh, I can't do that. He's incomparable. I find none of them uh, in his same category in terms of intelligence. Now, if I use intelligence, I'm using that in the classical, uh, traditional uh, sense, in which it refers primarily uh, to priorities and proportionalities. That is to say, seeing what the issue is and speaking to it directly. I know of no one who uh, stands in the same category as Prithoff Schuon uh, when reckoned by that specific criterion. For Schuon, the great error of modern Western philosophy after the Middle Ages was to divorce ratio from intellectus. That is the reasoning faculty in the human mind from the intellect and confusing the two. Not only divorcing it, but reducing the intellect to reason. That is, I think, what is at the heart of his critique of modern philosophy. Shuan spoke about two kind, kinds of knowledge, encyclopedic knowledge and spiritual knowledge. And Shuan was a genius in both spheres. His encyclopedic knowledge was awesome. He knew the details about all the religions, and I cannot exaggerate how he knew the details of Shinto, the details of Islam, the details of Christianity. Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Protestant. Shuan, of course, was a, a genius in spiritual knowledge, knowledge of the heart, knowledge of the intellect, as Eckhart called it. Titus Borchardt was a wonderful writer. His writings were very clear, crystalline, and uh, he himself was like a crystal. Uh, not only made, did he make a major contribution uh, in writing about Islamic art and Islamic metaphysics and religion, but he was also one of those magnets, people to whom everybody else feels attracted. Titus Burke had tended to specialize in cosmological subjects. He dealt with the spiritual astrology of Muhyiddin ibn Arabi and he wrote a book on alchemy, the spiritual symbolism of metallurgy. And that is, may I call it, a wonderful eye-opener as to what this rather mysterious and obscure subject of alchemy really means. The other aspect of Burkhardt's work is his uh, analysis of scientism and its many ramifications in modern life, and in, in particular the essay Cosmology and Modern Science, where he, he says 
what most needs to be said about modern science generally and about some of its particular manifestations, uh, particularly evolutionism and psychologism. Also, when he was a specialist in traditional art, one can regard that as belonging to the domain of cosmology, sacred art. In two books, his writings on doctrine and sacred art and cosmology are well summed up. One is Mirror of the Intellect, and the other one is the essential Titus Burkhardt. These two books constitute a very well-rounded presentation of Burkhardt's intellectual and spiritual contribution, and they indicate the major role which he played in the perennialist school. Mention should also certainly be made of Martin Lings, who uh, in some respects is, is um, perhaps the most easily accessed of the great perennialist writers, uh, in particular if I mention his book Ancient Beliefs and Modern Superstitions, uh, a work in which he is able to distill some very profound truths in, in simple language, uh, uh, writing in a, in a plain style uh, but very eloquent. Uh, I've found that a very useful work for introducing people to the to the uh, perennialist outlook. I think perhaps his most important work is his Life of the Prophet, based on tr traditional accounts. Um, this is, a, this is a, a work of, as one would hope and expect, a work of uh, tremendous formality and sobriety and beauty. And uh, the Life of the Prophet is is uh, recounted in all of its uh, in all of its um, uh, majesty and profundity. The ancient beliefs in modern superstitions is, in a nutshell, talks about the paradox of this idea of modern idea of progress, which is a myth, as opposed to traditional worlds who are anchored in realities, eternal realities. Some of his other later works um, take the form of question and answers and uh, uh, are very useful for spiritual seekers. Um, but uh, yes, Martin Ling's certainly a major figure in the perennialist movement. Marco Pallas was born in 1895 and he became one of the earliest Western practitioners of um, Tibetan Buddhism. He traveled to Tibet on several occasions and nearby countries as well and studied there with lamas in the tradition. He was also deeply influenced by the writings of the traditionalists uh, Mene Geno, Ananda Kumaraswamy and Frijal Shuan, each of whom he in fact knew personally and interacted with. As a committed Buddhist and as a traditionalist as well, he wrote naturally on Buddhism, especially in its uh, Tibetan branches, but also on the nature of tradition in general. He was particularly interested in what he termed the Buddhist-Christian dialogue, uh, recognizing that while on one level there are certain irreconcilable differences between the traditions on another and higher level, these two traditions join hands, so to speak, in a transcendent unity. At the time of, uh, of Pallas's early writings, uh, uh, the Tibetan tradition was um, very little known in the West, and those who knew anything of it tended to have a rather prejudiced view of it as some sort of, you know, superstitious hocus-pocus and, uh, you know, mumbo-jumbo. Uh, Marco Pallas uh, in, in Peaks and Lamas and later in The Way and the Mountain, which I actually think is a much more important book than Peaks and Lamas, although much less popular. Marco Pallas was able to give us a, an account of the Tibetan tradition in the context of uh, the perennialist outlook. So uh, his, his works also, I think, have a very special place in the in the uh, perennialist school. Lord Northbourne was one of the English members of the perennialist school. 
he came to this perspective actually through his writings and interest in agriculture. He was the, um, credited with coining the term organic farming. And for Lord Northbourne, organic farming didn't just mean not using uh, pesticides, it meant the proper relationship between, uh, between man and his creator, between the, the whole cosmos as a whole should be maintained. His very first book, Look to the Land, was discovered by Marco Pallas, and uh, it was Marco Pallas who introduced him to the perspective, and he went on to write um, two beautiful and very simple books that uh, introduce the perspective to a wider audience. Another Englishman, uh, more or less contemporary with Martin Lings, uh, his work, Religion in the Modern World, is a marvellous introduction to uh, traditionalist thought. Uh, again, written in a fairly simple style and uh, not requiring any technical expertise in metaphysics or uh, philosophy or anything of that sort. So a, a work that any intelligent reader can, can read easily. In the years from the 1920s to the 1960s, the works of Gaynon, Kumra Swami, and Shuan kindled writers in such diverse fields as Christianity, the American Indian religion, and comparative religion studies to write about the unifying and perennial themes of the world's great religions. Whitehall Perry met Gaynon in Egypt and later moved to Switzerland to live near Frithjof Schuon. Perry wrote scathing critiques of the modern Catholic Church and Gurdjieff, but he is best known for his monumental compilation titled A Treasury of Traditional Wisdom. Joseph Brown read the works of Frithjof Schuon and soon attached himself to him, serving as Schuon's intermediary with the American Indian spiritual leaders during the 1940s and 50s, which led to Brown's book, The Sacred Pipe, Black Elk's Account of the Seven Rites of the Oglala Sioux. Philip Sherrard was an English author and scholar educated at Cambridge who entered the Orthodox Church while writing his doctoral thesis in Greece. In his writings, Sherrard described an oncoming environmental catastrophe which he believed was the result of mankind's neglect of spiritual ideals and practices from a perennialist perspective. Sayed Hussein Nasser's first introduction to the writings of the three leading perennialists, Gaynon, Kumra Swami, and Shuan, came during a seminar on Oriental philosophy in his junior year at MIT in the early 1950s. Nasser was deeply influenced by Shuan's metaphysical and philosophical writings, and when he eventually met Frithjof Shuan in the 1960s, he recognized Shuan's spiritual authority and depth. Over the ensuing decades, Nasser has made a unique contribution to bringing the perennialist perspective into the academic study of religion. Sayyid Hussein Nasser, of course, is the one who has done perhaps most for the propagation of, of the perennialist outlook through his tireless uh, participation in debates, in, in broadcasts, in conferences, through his relentless traveling around the world. Uh, he has worked uh, tremendously uh, for, uh, for perennialism and, and tradition. Said Hussein Nasr is, is a rather unique case of a perennialist or traditionalist who is at the same time an academic. He's a well-known professor in Washington, D.C., and he has published extensively not only on tradition and on religion, with emphasis of Islam, because after all he's professor of Islamic studies in America, but also on the environment. His writings on, on the environment are extremely important because he has described what nature really should mean to man as a symbol of higher realities as being essentially sacred when modern man regards nature as a thing, just a thing without meaning, to be exploited and to be used according to his whims and fancies. All environmentalists 
ought to read his book Man and Nature because it's so important giving the complete and comprehensive dimension and not only that of the scientists. Most modern scholarly approaches to religion are based, in my opinion, on the false and mentally crippling idea that the only kind of knowledge we humans can have is limited to the empirical order. We have to see, hear, taste, touch, or smell something to know it. And obviously, if that's the case, we can know nothing at all about God or the spiritual world or human immortality. Academic endeavor is a branch of modern science. And the problem with modern science it's not that it tells us the truth about atoms. The problem with modern science is that consciously or unconsciously it excludes higher levels of reality from the beginning. Therefore, it can never reach higher levels of reality in the end. Modern scholars, therefore, who have this empirical bias are essentially limited to doing one of three things. The first, simply look at religion as nonsense and spend their times debunking it cynically, skeptically as something that's a kind of residue from man's pre-scientific past. The second group of scholars would say, no, religion has certain positive value, but that value is still strictly historical, horizontal, and social. Religions promote virtue, honesty, justice, and so forth. And then a third group would be themselves personally believers in God but they would feel as though they have to shield that belief from their students. Still, like the other scholars, speaking only about historical matters, the transmission of sacred texts over time, archeological evidence from ancient sites, and so forth. Let others dabble in mental sport, or what passes for such. That is their affair. But such things as these are of no interest to us. For the metaphysician, what matters is to know what is and to know it in such a fashion as to be oneself truly and effectively what one knows. René Guénon. Chouan once referred to these things by saying that modern inquiry starts from doubt and ancient wisdom started from certainty. In academia, one is often trained in considering things on the level of the ground, so to speak, as we say in French, on the level of daisies, whereas uh, Chouan's point of view is that of the, of the eagle, as it has often been, been said. Um, so this, these two scopes are, of course, antagonistic in a certain sense. Most college professors, most other faculty, having been trained to suppose that ideas and worldviews are strictly a function of historical period, uh, political or economic class, gender, etc., etc., most scholars don't think you can have any notion whatsoever of something that's truly absolute. There's no truth with a capital T for those people. I am not a relativist. Today, today all the scholars are relativists. I am, I am absolute, absolutist. That's the, the difference, mm -hmm. you see. Mm -hmm. I believe in truth, and the official scholars don't believe in truth. Perennialist scholarship begins with the conviction, as Frithjof Schuon would put it, that man is made for the absolute. In other words, that we have a capacity to know God directly. The perennialist teaches about religion. He writes about religion with the idea, with the conviction, that his teaching and writing can have a transformative impact on his students, changing not simply how they look at the world, but the world that they look at, changing the kind of people they are. I think in this regard of something that the great metaphysician and art historian Ananda Kumaraswamy once said, 
he was asked about his own scholarship and he said that he did what he did in the first place for his own soul's salvation and secondly for those who might benefit from his results. And this seems to me characteristic of all perennialist scholarship. Friedrich Schuon first said that I write to make people think correctly. He was interested in reviving the art of thinking correctly. And he addressed his books to the intelligent Western audience whose intelligence had not become atrophied by the limited perspectives of modern philosophies, sciences, and the like, whose intelligence had not become totally divorced from the sacred. Uh, his writings try to address people in whom uh, attraction to the sacred and functioning of intelligence went together. Most students are open to the idea that there is a truth to be known, something that's behind or beneath or beyond this world of facts and change. And those students respond very positively, I would say, in general terms to a perennialist perspective or a perennialist approach to religion and philosophy, sacred art and symbolism and so forth. As an example, I find that Frithjof Schuon's signature idea that there is a transcendent unity of religions works beautifully as a framework in my introductory class to world religions. And I also make use of his teaching that every religion is a combination of doctrine and method, of theory and practice. Also his teaching that the spiritual life is a combination of truth, virtue, beauty, prayer. These insights work very well at that level of teaching. It's not too difficult to find modern philosophers of religion now who write about pluralism and about accepting other religions as legitimate and they almost inevitably advocate tolerance. But what are they really saying? If their underlying point of view is that no one religion can possibly have full possession of the truth, but that many religions can have various elements of the truth in them, then these uh, uh, modern philosophers can uh, safely advocate tolerance among the religions since they're all equal as imperfect receptacles of the truth. This kind of approach to religious tolerance might look enlightened on the face of it, but it's based on a constriction of the scope of each religious tradition. It assumes that none of them can transmit the full truth and therefore uh, also a full and really adequate spiritual method. It's like deciding that no one form of music can express perfect musicality in every aspect, so therefore each is equally inadequate and thus do an equal measure of tolerance. Now, tolerance is not understanding. The approach of perennialists is different. A perennialist philosopher teaches that each religion is in possession of the full truth. This full truth exists at the core of each, but upon that foundation, a system of expressions of the one truth rests. These expressions are like different dialects of a single language. Each one speaks to the special mindset and situation of a given people. So if you get to the underlying essence of your own religious tradition, you can more fully understand others, whether they are Muslims or Christians or Hindus or whatever because their traditions proceed from the same underlying truth as your own. That's the only real way to have a valid interfaith dialogue. A primary objective of perennialist thought is to demonstrate what the underlying truth is within the different forms of spirituality and to examine how and why it's expressed in a manner that's specific to that one segment of humanity. Now all of this explains why Frithjof Schuon doesn't like the idea of ecumenism, but instead he speaks of esoteric ecumenism. That's to say that the esoteric dimensions of a religion, which are necessarily 
at the root of the religion, which proceeds from uh, a single truth, the esoteric ecumenism then implies that the way for religions to cross a bridge to, to others is through the esoteric dimension, through understanding a depth, the essence that comes from God, which each one shares with others. I think that there's a fair and fairly widely distributed interest today in ideas relating to the perennial philosophy. The, there's a s desire to not only accept the validity of other religions, but to know how to also practice one of them. And uh, it's very easy to say that um, everything is valid. It's a little bit harder to say that everything is valid and I'm going to do one particular thing. The approach of perennialism and traditionalism allows that. And I think that, that something that younger people, myself and, and even younger, who are looking around at the various new age phenomenon, um, on the one hand, and then on the kind of a fundamentalist or exclusivist uh, phenomenon on the other hand, they're looking for some kind of middle path, in a sense, that avoids those two extremes of kind of total acceptance of, of everything, but with a kind of with lack of content or a lack of um, firmness and direction, and on the other hand, a, uh, a, a being closed off to uh, any other truths and to being totally exclusivist. Religions may be likened in their outward or exoteric aspects to different points on the circumference of a circle, and in their esoteric or mystical paths to radii leading from these points to the one center which represents the divine truth. This image shows exoterism as the necessary starting point of mysticism. And it also shows that whereas the different exoterisms may be relatively far from each other, the mysticisms are all increasingly near and ultimately identical, converging upon the same point. Martin Lings The authors who founded the Perennialist School were united in their adherence to the truth which has always been and which always will be. Their written works endeavored to remind the world of that timeless truth in order to lead mankind back to the saving truth within all the world's great religions. Their message and their purpose can perhaps be best expressed by the words of the perennial school's preeminent spokesman, Frith Jao Shuan. In fact, everything has been said already, though it is far from being the case that everyone has always understood it. There can be, therefore, no question of presenting new truths. However, what is needed in our time, and indeed in every age as it moves away from the origins of revelation, is to provide some people with keys fashioned afresh. Keys no better than the old ones, but merely more elaborated and reflective, in order to help them rediscover the truths written in an eternal script in the very substance of the spirit. Frith Joff Shuan.